Okay, let's start. Welcome to this afternoon's session. My name is Yuri Olchenko, and I'm going to open a session with a talk on genetic control of variation of protein and glycosylation in human populations. Um, and maybe the most difficult thing for me will be to keep myself in check, so I'm going to use my timer, and hopefully it will be not too disturbing. Right. It's interesting, when I first came to the conferences organized on glycomics by Gordon, I felt like this strange bird who is talking about genetics, and nobody's doing genetics. And it's, it's very interesting how much we transformed over these years, because you know we already seen some genetics work reported, and it's quite exciting. And in this talk, you know, Sometimes you will see me, you know, thinking because I'm still processing information from previous talks. So with more and more data generated, with more and more approaches, we try to, you know, map the complex glycobiology. Things are starting to click. So it's, I think it's really exciting time to work in this field. You know, also as a geneticist. This is my disclaimer slide. And... As usual, I will start with a few words about genetics. I'm, I'm geneticist by training and by profession, so I cannot, you know, miss a chance to uh, do some ode to genetics. And then the body of my talk, and then a few slides on conclusions and discussion. So why, why genetics is so wonderful as a tool to study human biology? It's because, well, basically that's the only thing where we can study human biology in vivo, right? Well, in principle, you could think of also randomized clinical trials, interventions, but all these things are expensive and take a long time, while in genetics, we are basically following up experiments of nature, how the inborn variation, genetic variation, changes our phenotypes, right? And then you can think in terms of uh, uh, experiments that you can see at uh, you know, different classes of variation. For example, if you have a coding variation which change the protein sequences, well, this is going to affect every tissue where this protein is expressed, right? Or you can think of something which would be analogous to conditional knockout, right? This would be a variation in an enhancer which could be tissue specific or stage of development specific, right? So in principle, you can you know, map many experimental concepts into these experiments on nature, of nature. Now, uh, when you do genetics, in principle, uh, you do forward genetics, you only need to be able to do two things. One thing is that you can measure genome, and we are able to measure human genomes with great precision and at high pace nowadays. And the other thing is that you need to be able to define and measure the things you are interested to study, right? And then genotic, genetics works in a way that you relate your variation of genome to the variation in the uh, phenotype of interest, revealing the regions where the genetic variation is related to your trait. Right. Uh, of course, this approach is, you know, observing these experiments, natural experiments of nature is not without limitations because when you think of like core biology, it's too important to, to be, you know, redundant, right? You don't see variation. Anyone who got variation in the core biology, well, they were basically not born, right? So where you can study these natural experiments is more peripheral biology, and that would usually map into relatively rare uh, <clears throat> Mendelian diseases, right? And even more, the populational variation, right? And populational variation, well, some may say, this is not a core biology, right? Why should we be interested? But it's extremely interesting because this periphery is where the evolution starts happening, right? It's where the biology explores new avenues uh, for development. All right. So on population level, one of the most powerful tools we use nowadays is genome-wide association studies. And basically what you do, and this is very lengthy slide, and I think most of you have seen it already, so I'm going to skip over it. But the idea here is that you are 
measuring many polymorphisms in the genome. And for each polymorphism, you do relatively simple analysis, uh, like regression analysis, trying to relate how variation in this site relates to the phenotype of interest, right? And for most of the uh, variations, you don't see anything, but for some you do. And when it passes genome-wide significance threshold, which is set rather high, you say something is going on in this region, right? Now, this is not end of the story because uh, we have linkage disequilibrium in human genome. Things are correlated. So when you get a signal, it doesn't pinpoint, usually it doesn't immediately pinpoint the gene. It pinpoints a region in the genome. And this region may contain many, many genes. So there is a big step which, you know, after you did a GVAS, and you want to, and biology is in the genes, not in, in, in variations, right? So when you go from uh, variant to gene, when you prioritize the genes in these regions, and when you can do it with high confidence, that's where, you know, we start talking biology, right? But this is not, you know, a very easy thing. And I guess for our loci, and we have a rather good rate, for about half we can confidently map the locus to a gene, right? So that's where we can start talking about function. And th this is not better rate, right? Okay, now the question and questions we are interested in are which tissue specific networks of genes determine intra-individual difference in human protein glycosylation and what is the nature of association between glycans and complex human disease. So this is, these are two questions, I think, uh, uh, my group, but also many people working in glycogenomics, if you prefer to the, this word, population of glycogenomics. Uh, these are one of the few main questions. Okay, so how we approach it? Okay, we have this GVAS, Gene-Wide Association Study Tool, and what you need, that's, you know, you measured your genome, now the only thing you need to start applying forward genetics is to measure your phenotype, right? And here it's quite straightforward. That's uh, a chromatogram, very similar to what Manfred was presenting, but basically you can tell every peak and its individual chromatogram. For other person it will be slightly different, some peaks higher, some peaks lower, but basically height of the peak or area under the peak or whatever you, you know, there are different methods to define it. That's your trait of interest, right? And you are talking about analyzing an ensemble of, you know, 40, 50, 120 traits, right? Depending on what type of glycome you look at, right? But it's, it's a bunch of quantitative traits and on each of these quantitative traits you can run uh, a simple univariate genome-wide association analysis, or you can run multivariate if you are, you know, interested in that, uh, as simple as that. Okay, now, again, I'm very excited at what's been happening in the field for the last few years, and this is one of the slides from my previous, uh, last year's presentation, basically, right, where I summarized that uh, altogether there were uh, nine studies of uh, uh, protein and glycosylation, uh, several studies of IgG, one study of transferring glycosylation, and several studies of like total blood plasma glycosylation, all together leading to robust replication, identification and replication of 34 loci. Now let's look what happened over, you know, just one year. And in fact, happened more, which we evidenced, you know, in the morning session, right? So I don't have some of these things on my slide anymore, right? It's outdated, right? I prepared it yesterday. It is outdated by today. That's wonderful, right? But basically, uh, we had a very big study of IgG galactosylation, right? We had one study of IgA N and O glycosylation, and by right, I highlight like important aspects of these works. Right? And we had a uh, rather big blood plasma meta-analysis, right? Altogether, you know, on the top of 34 loci known last year, put in 19, right? So it goes almost, well, it's not double, but it's close to it, right? For N-glycosylation and two first ever learned uh, loci for O-glycosylation. Okay, so these are 
wonderful news. So what I'm going to present la later in trying to systemize uh, you know, what we learned since last year uh, is mostly coming from here, right? Because that's basically the major contributor to this uh, 19. For example, for uh, IgA and an oglike isolation, uh, in fact, uh, only two oglike isolation loci are new because the rest totally overlap with uh, uh, and like isolation of IgG, which is not very surprising because the cell type is, well, basically the same. These are both B cells and they are like having very much the same uh, uh, glycosylation machinery, right? Okay. Now, we know that plasma, total plasma glycon, basically you rip off your glycans from all your uh, plasma, uh, blood plasma glycoproteins. The two major contributors to this mix are liver and uh, immunoglobulins coming from lymphoid tissue, right? Okay, now if we try to characterize and to, to separate the loci which we identify in this geosis by trying to leverage, we can try to leverage uh, tissue-specific expression of the genes which prioritized and the spectrum of glycans affected by the locus where we prioritize this gene, right? So what we can try to do, what we're trying to do now is from this complex mixture where we know that liver and uh, antibody producing cells are major contributors, we are trying to decipher the individual contributions of the two tissues, right? Well, what we see is uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, straightforward in a way. On the top, you have the genes which are you know, are way more expressed in plasma cells compared to liver, and on the bottom, these are liver genes, right? And, you know, you see these names like um, haptoglobin, complement factor H, and, uh, well, serpina-1 is uh, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin gene, right? So these are typical, uh, you know, liver, uh, uh, liver-produced uh, proteins, right? And on the top you have things like Icarus-1, which is differentiation and life support function for uh, your B cells. Uh, uh, things like TNF-RSF-13B, which is also supporting uh, the, the, the life of, of B cells. Okay, now the interesting thing is that we can also look into spectrum of glycans associated with this loci, right? and now try to put it together. And here, I'm skipping this slide. Okay, uh, on this axis, I have the expression of these genes, each gene is a dot in liver, and on y-axis, I have expression of these genes in uh, plasma cells, right? Now, this gray area in that corner, that's basically saying, well, the it's below detection limit, right? And obviously we don't have any genes here. If we see any dot there, that would say something went terribly wrong with our gene prioritization, right? Up until 3.5 here and here, it's low level of expression, right? So it's kind of, we can detect it, but it's really not high enough, right? It's not, it's not re really high, right? So uh, what you see is few things which are quite obvious. For example, now the, this blue painting is saying that the associated spectrum of, of lipids is coming from immunoglobulins, right? So you see in this upper part that these are the genes which are strongly expressed in uh, plasma cells, but not really expressed in liver, right? And the spectrum of glycans associated with them is, is blue, right? So it's immunoglobulins, makes sense. Now, in this area, it's all painted uh, brown, right, which is saying that they are expressed in liver, not so much in, in plasma cells, and the associated spectrum is, is uh, uh, liver uh, um, glycans, right? So, so far, so good, makes total sense. Now, this is interesting. You may almost think, like, if a gene is expressed both in liver and in plasma cells, you would expect genetic regulation of both types of uh, spectrum of glycans. But, okay, sorry. 
what you see is that the genetic regulation, even if gene is expressed in both tissues, the genetic regulation is exclusive to the tissue type, right? So this is probably happens because, uh, you know, like B4 GALT1, we know it's expressed in liver and in, in, in plasma cells, right? It's, it's very important glycosyl transferase, right? But it's genetically regulated only in plasma cells, right? So this is probably this tissue-specific enhancer variation which only works in plasma cells, in B cells, but not in liver. In liver, it's uniform, right? So we can almost say like B4 GALT1 is still evolving, but it's not evolving anymore in liver, right? It's, it's evolving in, uh, you know, in B cells. Okay, so this is, I think, rather interesting. We have exception to the rule, but this, you know, exception confirms this rule. So FAT6 and FAT8, they are affecting the spectrum of glycans which are typical for liver and the spectrum of glycans which is typical for, uh, uh, for, for immunoglobulins, for pl plasma cells, right? But if you try to look into like colocalization of these signals, you discover these are two different genetic signals. So genetic regulation of these guys are specific. One mechanism of regulation for liver another mechanism for the same gene in plasma cells. This is quite amazing, right? It's like totally uh, specific to, uh, right. Uh, well, these two are very interesting one, but I, I think I'm going to run out of time if I try to talk about them further. Okay, uh, now if you try to, to uh, map the genes which we implicated and loci which we implicated in and glycosylation, uh, if you try to map them on the diseases, you find that about half, at least now, we could also relate to different diseases, right? And I'm not going to go into you know, many details of this, probably this slide is more to impress you, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things which were new, which we discovered in our recent study. And this is like, there is this interesting triad here, GCKR31 and Serpina1, and they are all colocalizing with a signal of uh, liver disease, MASLD, which uh, Manfred was talking about, right? So we are highlighting pathway which is overlapping with liver disease and glycans, right? And another thing which I found very interesting, and again, this is about liver, and it's about liver because this is like the biggest study now in sample sizes which allows to look into liver, unlike IgG where we already had very big sample sizes. So here we see this um, haptoglobin, and complement factor H and the gay serpina one, these are acute response proteins, right? Anti-inflammatory proteins. I find this very interesting and you know, I could speculate for a long time what specifically could be the mechanism, but you know, happy to discuss with any of you. But I find it very interesting. Okay, coming to conclusions. <laughs> so I took it from last year and extended it and you know, in red highlighting the change. So genetic variation in at least 55 loci is associated with changes in human protein and, well, glycosylation, not and glycosylation anymore, right? Very happy. Almost doubled since last year, huge progress. Uh, plasma and glycoma is driven by glycosylation in liver and hepatic issue. This is, well, kind of obvious, but nice to see this confirmed on this level as well. Uh, interesting thing is that, you know, although expression of many of these genes are, is kind of restricted to one of the tissues, right? Even when it's not, the genetic regulation is restricted, right? So this is, this is I, I, I find also very interesting. And I guess this is telling us something about evolution of tissues. Genetics starting to offer clues to the mechanisms common between glycosylation and cancers, cardiovascular, autoimmune, and inflammatory disease, 
and this year I think we can claim also into the liver function. Okay, what about the future? Uh, well, in a way it's copy-paste of the things which are happening in genetics and genomics, right, only translated to this specific area, right? We think that studying more, you know, samples will give us higher resolution, right? And studying more individual protein glycosylations will give us more and more information, you know, trying to map these pathways and understanding how these things work. Basically, laying in solid fundament for strong causal human glycobiology, right? Unique thing about genes is that they are you no know, cause, not consequence. So they form the fundament of causal biology. Multiomics profiling is another big thing and uh, basically it gives, uh, it allows you some build up of your mechanistic hypothesis, how things work. I think our, you know, simple exercise of overlaying expression with spectrum of, you know, glycans affected gives a little bit of example how this could work. And I think it works well, pretty well in distinguishing the, you know, uh, the, it is about mechanism, right? Is it working through liver or through, through your lymphoid tissue, right? It's very fundamental. And then functional screens will confirm and complement our mechanistic understanding. All these to answer the question, how glycobiology, human glycobiology, human glycogenomics fits in the bigger picture of human health and disease. Well, thank you very much. And here are some pictures of people who really did all this heavy lifting and, you know, me just presenting their work here. Thank you. If we have time for one question, if not. No. Yeah, a very nice talk. Just a, a one technical question. Did you, when you say hepatocytes, did you purify out hepatocytes or are you just taking chunks of liver? So hepatocytes are one cell type in the liver. There are cholangiocytes, there are sinusoidal endothelial cells, there are Kupner cells. When I'm looking at the expression. Yeah. Hepatocytes. Hep purified, hep from purified hepatocytes. Okay. Uh, you you uh, had on your summary slide genetic regulation. Is this a, a transcriptional regulation, or how do you interpret this? Um, this, this is this is pretty. <laughs> yeah, genetic regulation. What I is upstream? Think this one. Okay. So basically, most of this is transcription. Okay. Yeah. So this guy open quadrant and almost for sure because otherwise it wouldn't work. It would like regulate like both you know, tissues. It is exclusive yeah. to a single tissue. Whereas these guys they have some of them, these guys that we have here, right? Some yeah. of them have structural variation. But because they are not really expressed in other tissue, right? We, we, we don't really have to have them. Yeah. So what I would love to see is what is upstream, you know? So the gene expression is likely regulated. So what are the upstream mechanisms? Is it metabolic? Is it uh, transcription factors, well, signals coming into the cell? So for, for some of these guys, it's possible to speculate, right? So the mechanism, one of them is because they have some of these things, right? Yeah. Or these are the guys who are playing roles in this kind of association. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just wondering, have you tried to estimate the occupancy of the site? How much of the site is actually glycosylated? And uh, the difference that we see, how much is due to the gene expression or the availability of the site, 
and how much is due to the black oscillation events. So does it make sense? Well, it says that for IGG, it should be like 40. So it's going to be But for like total plasma glycol, we don't even know proteins are supposed to be, right? That's we, we know like three and quarter and ten of the structures are not generated in lymphoid tissues. That, that's how we can distinguish, mm -hmm. right? But uh, uh, I think uh, frequency, this is more attraction to, to Gordon and Mantle. Maybe I mean, this is like in the spectrum. And, uh, for IDG, I mean, it should be like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. We should now go to the next speaker of the session. Avra Popovic-Hocic, we are just talking.